Look at this heavenly chicken dish. This is chicken poblano. It's chicken with poblanos and some tomatoes and, and garlic and some rice on the side over here. And this is a fantastic stewed dish. If you've never had chicken poblano, you need to give this a try. And if you've had it, well, I don't have to explain anything further. I'll tell you what, give this one a try. Chicken poblano. Hello. Welcome back to Texas Cooking Today. On this episode of Texas Cooking Today, we're going to be making chicken poblano. Chicken poblano is just a fabulous harmony of ingredients that will explode with flavor in your mouth. A co-worker of mine asked me, why don't you have that on your show yet? That tastes fantastic. She said it was the best she'd ever had. So I'll tell you what, let me show you the ingredients and I'll show you how to make the best tasting dish you've ever had. Oh, uh, I do want to mention, this is a great after work meal. It takes very little work, it takes a single pot, there's less cleanup, and it's very easy. So, let me show you the ingredients and let's make chicken poblano. Well now let's get on with this wonderful dish that's named after our two primary ingredients here chicken and poblano. The poblano flavor mixed with the acid and the flavor of tomato that's nice and sweet, they both just form this beautiful harmony of flavors and we're going to have some other items too. Let me show off what we have here. We have 8 ounces of tomato sauce. This is 16 ounces of diced tomatoes in their own juice. 1 cup of white wine or I use a white Zinfandel or you can use a red wine. The best wine to use with this dish is whatever you're drinking. So if you're drinking a specific wine, put that in it and you're going to automatically pair this dish with what you're having for the evening. Now right over here, I have some of my other ingredients that we're going to use to flavor this. I have some cayenne, paprika, a bit of garlic and some salt. And we're going to use that to bring out some intense flavors. But also I need something to go with it that's sort of a nice neutral and I have some rice here. Whichever rice you prefer, however, I think basmati is the way to go. It's an Indian rice and it is quick cooking. It takes about 15 minutes to cook it up. It keeps a good firm texture. It does not uh, get real sticky because it's very low in starch. Give this a try. Now, let's get on with this. And if you'll notice in the background over here, I've got, of course, my cooking oil. And I also have a propane torch. And we're going to try doing something here that I've never done on video before and I wanted to try it out. Normally I remove the skin on these by just putting them on a burner or under a broiler or out on the grill and just cook it off. And I'm going to put these on the burner but while that's happening I'm going to try the torch and see how well it works on these and that way y'all will see if it's worth doing or not. So let's get on with this. We're going to start with our poblanos. Let's make us some chicken poblano. Yummy. Now the best way I know of and have used in the past of removing the skin from these little guys is to simply turn on my gas, fire up the burners, and put them directly on it. And that way they're directly on a good hot gas heat. That's the best way I know. Uh, and that is so far. I'm going to try this torch. I've never done that before. I'm just going to give it a quick shot and see what happens here. The crackling you're hearing is the skin blistering on the underside. Won't need that high of a flame, I don't think. Oh, look at that go. That's beautiful. See how it blisters the skin? It causes it to pop and crackle.
liquid up at the, uh, the head of the nozzle, and that's what caused the system to get knocked out. Now let's take a look at the underside of these. Whoops, I almost lost him. There we go. We're getting good scorching there. But it seems to me that torch for the amount of time it takes, if you don't have a gas stove or, or a, a grill, this might be a great option for you. That tip that didn't get hit earlier by the stove. Remember, if you get um, so there we have it, the first time try. It's a complete success for scorching off the skin on a chili really well. I hope you heard me, that was a loud roar. I was saying that we now have a good method of scorching these off, in case that was too loud, that uh, doesn't require the use of a gas stove. And also it allows me to get to places that normally wouldn't have gotten hit as well. Finish them up real easy. And of course, the torch is nice in the kitchen. You don't have to have one. But if you're going to do like Alaska or creme brulee or something like that, they're quite handy. Okay, I think we're about finished on this one. Well, there we have it. Now I need to get down a little rack to put these on. And move them over to the sink and I'm just gonna wash them off. See, that wasn't too difficult, was it? Like I said, you can also do this under a broiler. Uh, you can do it in many ways. Just whatever high direct heat you can apply to that will work fine. And also, if it's not scorching the skin off well enough for you, then put them inside of a plastic bag and, and zip it closed and let them sit in there for about five or ten minutes to sweat and it'll help sweat that skin loose. And we're here at the sink and I have finished up our uh, cooking off the skin on these. Now what I want to do next is to simply take this old skin off of here and some people will tell you just to peel it off dry like this and that way you don't disturb any of the oils underneath it and you have a more pure and natural tasting product. Well you know what, they're actually kind of right, alright? However, I am not going to sit and pick at chilies like this and do this, no. I have an easier way. I like to just put it under running water and the oils I lose are the oils I lose. And frankly these have such a potent flavor to them that I would uh, not worry too much about that. So let's just do it the other way. Now the other thing I like to do when I have it under water like this, let me show you here. Off. We'll turn that off for a moment. On the side of your poblanos, just take your finger and push it straight in like that and pull down. It makes a little tear in it. And you can pull this back. And in the top, you'll notice there's the seed pot with the crown all together. So just pull that off. And seeds also occur along the veins in a poblano. So you'll see little clusters sometimes along the veins inside. Just pull those free and give them a quick wash go. This is ready to be sliced or used just like it is. If you were making a uh, chili relleno, of course, you would not have removed the crown. So I'm going to finish all these up and we're going to get on to what we do next. This is honestly the hardest part of this whole dish.
If you have a strainer basket in your sink, as you see, the skins will quickly clog it. Just be prepared for that eventuality. This one's likely going to be slightly warmer. The seeds were slightly darker. That's the only way I've ever found of detecting whether they're hotter or not. And at the most, the hottest one of these I've ever ran into is less than half of the fire of a typical jalapeno. So don't be afraid of using uh, poblanos. They're very light and mild when it comes to heat, but they're robust in their flavor. Let's take care of slicing up these beautiful poblano chilies now. I'm going to take them one at a time, just lay them open, and make a cut right down the middle. That kind of flattens them out and makes them easier to work with. And this one has a little seed that was hiding. Not a big thing. It doesn't matter if a seed or two makes it in. Not going to hurt a thing. If you'll notice, I'm going to make some strips, and they're about 3 eighths of an inch wide, or like a wide french fry. There we are. And these strips, the side of the bowl. Now, if you wish, you can do these in pairs or one at a time. If you'll notice the way I'm cutting these, how I keep my thumb behind my first finger. There you go. Be careful when you use the knife as a trap. You don't want to cut yourself. And what I'm doing. I'm putting my thumb back, curving the fingers under. Those finger tips down here have to be in further from the knuckle above. And then the knuckle should be straight up and down. And this way, it holds the food in place. And I just move my hand back a little space at a time, each time holding the food down with those fingers. And the last cut is usually the hardest, right there. That's all there is to that, see? good way to practice slicing. All right, now we have those ready to go into our chicken poblano. All right, it's time to get this on the road. We have our burner already on high. Let's heat that pan up some. As it's coming up in temperature, I'm gonna put some olive oil in it. You can also use peanut oil for this or any other kind of cooking oil you prefer. A bit of matter right there in my wine. There we go. Now, what I'm doing is to bring the pan up in temperature a little bit first. What I'm wanting to do here is to provide a nice sear on the outside of the chicken. And that's not so much to do anything for the chicken as it is to provide extra flavor in this dish. And this pan is probably not hot enough to sear yet. The quick way to test, a little bit of water. See how it evaporates quickly? That means it's not hot enough. If it's hot enough, the water will dance around on the skillet because a vapor barrier forms between the water and the hot surface, and that allows that bubble to stay in there a much longer period of time. That's the kind of temperature we need for a good sear. It's also a good way to know if your pan is hot enough to make pancakes. Not hot enough. So, this is a double clad pan, which means the cladding comes all the way up on the side. These do take a little bit longer to heat, however, they retain heat better and they simmer better. For this dish, I'm going to recommend that you use a pan that's got a wide bottom on it and something with a lid. It's important that it has a lid because we're going to be covering this and simmering with it in just a little bit. Now, do you see how that water skates around inside of it? That's what we're looking for. That means the pan is hotter. So I'm going to put in some oil here. And I might add a little bit of peanut oil to this to help raise the temperature of that olive oil. And the peanut oil is really handy because once you blend it with it and it has such a high heat retention, you don't notice the flavor of the peanut oil. But you get the flavor of that olive oil with a higher uh, threshold that it can handle. Now let's take our chicken and put it with the outside down first. We're going to cook that part to leak. Now 
Now, at first your chicken will stick a little bit. Don't worry about that. You're going to allow that to happen. And as it's cooking, it's going to release and it starts to caramelize. I'll try to speak loud enough with this thing frying. Set your temperature to medium high at this point. spattering by the use of a fry string. Nice little device to have. Beautiful odor coming into the air, mixing with the odor of the poblanos from just a moment ago. See how we have this light browning on there? I'll that for just a little longer. That's all I want is just a light sear on the outside of it. I want to sear the bottom just a little more. What this will give me is a better flavor from the chicken. When it's ready, it will easily lift right off of the pan. It does not require non-stick anything. wonderful odor. Now, if you'll notice, there's pink edges still on that chicken, and uh, those pink edges show that that chicken isn't cooked all the way through, and that's fine. I'm only trying to get the uh, flavor to develop a little bit more right now. this dip, you're going to be floored by the flavor.
us to complete. Nothing more than a pretty tomato in. Got tomato sauce in there. And this one I'm going to go ahead and clean out every bit because that tomato sauce makes a big difference. Now, we have our chilies. Put those right down into that dish. Nothing more to it than that. Does this look easy? It is. Put some wine in this. All right. Just more there. That's one cup even. I'm gonna place some salt over the top of the whole thing. And this is about a teaspoon worth. I'm going to do a very, very light dusting of cayenne. The cayenne's going to bump up the heat. If you don't like a, a hot, spicy dish, don't use the cayenne. Paprika, don't be afraid of using it. It'll give it a warm tone without actually bumping up the heat of the dish. So on that, I'll use about two teaspoons and about half a teaspoon of the cayenne. At the most, two teaspoons on the paprika. Now also, we had some garlic that we needed to put in there, but I'm gonna have to slice this up. So, let's take care of that before we move on. Now on this garlic, it's gonna be really simple. I don't have to mince this or anything. I'm just gonna do simple sliced garlic because this is gonna be a stewed item. So what I need to do just to break this apart, and a couple ways you can do that is just to burp your fingernail into it and, and pull back, and eventually you'll get into that garlic. The other way is to push it down. Nice and firm, it'll break the whole thing apart, and you'll have cloves right there. And when I'm making this dish, where, whoops, I shot one out of my fingers. When I'm making this dish, I like to use, I'm having a hard time here, I like to use three cloves of this. And this is really fresh garlic, and that skin is on there very tight. Let's see if I can get it right this time. Nope, they're going to break on me. So there's garlic method number two, which is break it. Then remove the skin. Always works for me. With my huge mess forming. There we go. And I'm just going to break the clove. Free one more clove. There we go. Don't I look messy with the garlic today? <laughs> This is being so sloppy. There we go. And this is so much like after work, you know, you just don't really feel like doing a whole lot. You can slice this garlic. You can break it apart like I'm doing, which is mangling it somewhat. And when it's really fresh like this and the skin is just not going to give up, it can be a challenge. There we go. It's really wet garlic too oily. Now, for the simple slices, if you want, you can just do this. Or you can do what I did earlier and just mash the clove completely. That'll be fine. I'm still going to go ahead and chop this a little bit. And on this, you can chop and throw in the whole thing, including that scab on the end. It's not going to hurt. That's because, again, I'm, like I said, it's going to be stewed. So I'm going to put it right over the top. I've got it now in my pan. And I'm going to mix this just a little bit. Get the spices down in there. There we go. Get some of the vegetables under the, under the chicken breast as well as on top. And allow all of those flavors to simply simmer and marry. So is this comes up to a boil, I will then reduce it to a simmer. I'm going to allow it to sit there and simmer for about 45 minutes. Now this has come up to a boil, so what I'm going to do is first put a lid on it, and then I'm going to reduce my heat to a medium low. We're just going to let that simmer in, uh, for about 45 minutes. That's all it's going to take. As you see, this is not really that difficult. It's up and simmering now. I have it at a medium low. And if it doesn't have a good vigorous simmer like this, 
then you might want to turn it up just slightly. It should be releasing uh, all of that alcohol in the form of vapor. Now on the rice, if you have chosen basmati rice like I have, at 10 minutes before the end of cooking on this, you're going to want to start your water heating. And uh, that gives you time for this to set up and uh, for about 10 minutes after cooking, after you take it off the heat. And that's good for it because it helps to draw the moisture back into the chicken breasts and it helps flavor them better. For the rice, you can use a little butter in this if you wish. I'm going to use about a tablespoon of butter. I want to use a pinch of salt, which is a half teaspoon. And here I have one half of a cup of basmati. And when it comes to rice proportions, it's always two to one. One part rice, two parts water. So since I have a half a cup of basmati here, I will need one cup of water. If I was using a cup of basmati, of course that would be two cups of water. A half of a cup will yield a healthy two portions. So, we want to remember that. If you're going to cook a regular white rice that normally takes about 30 minutes to cook, then you're going to want to uh, start that a little earlier. So you'll want to start it about 20 to 25 minutes before the end of the cook on this. Now, we're going to set our timer. Since the simmer is up and running, there we go. I'll set my timer at 45 minutes, and that gives me time to go and sit and relax and cool down because I'm really hot right now. Good. 45 minutes, up and running. Every once in a while I'll come in and kind of move things around in there about every 15-20 minutes and that's just to keep anything from sitting on the bottom in one spot too long and possibly burning. Alright, that's all there is to it. I can't wait. Oh, this is delicious. The timer has just now gone off for 10 minutes until this is done. Now I have in my pan here one tablespoon of butter and I've just poured in one cup of water. I'm going to put that on high and I'm going to add in also a little bit of salt. I want about a half a teaspoon of salt in there. As soon as this comes to a boil, I'm going to put my rice in it, stir it, bring it to a boil again, and then I'll lower the temperature to a simmer and cover it. Basmati cooks quickly, so it'll be done in 15 minutes. That's the beauty of this particular rice. It's one of the reasons I really love it. It's very quick cooking. It also has the better flavor than most any rice you've ever tasted in your life. Now over here, we've been simmering for a while now. And that looks beautiful. Occasionally just lift the lid and kind of move the breast around a little bit so you know, like I mentioned, you don't get any burning on the bottom, especially in the center. And that's all there is to it. That smells good. The water on the rice has now come up to a boil. Cooking rice is very simple. Do not make it difficult. Do not stir it during the cooking process at all. Stir it one time at the beginning just to get it mixed well. Bring it to a boil, then cover it, reduce the temperature to simmer, and let it simmer. Excuse me, making lots of noise today. For simmering this, like I said, don't stir it and don't lift the lid to check on it. Just check it uh, after the steam starts to slow down on it. That's when you know it's going to be about ready. You should see what looks like a bunch of little dimples in the top of the rice when it's done. There, it's up to a boil. I'm going to reduce my temperature to a simmer. There we go. And we'll let that sit there and simmer until it's my ready. My timer has just gone off, so I'm now going to turn off this chicken. I'm going to set it aside and just allow it to set. Over here, our rice, it's still cooking and it's going to need about, oh, let's give that another seven to eight minutes since it's about, uh, it's been in there for about seven minutes now, so another seven to eight. It's time that we check this rice. It has been in here for about 14 minutes. I'm going to pull this lid back. You'll notice those little dimples I was talking about in the top. But the best way I know of checking this is just to pull it back in the center. And if it looks dry on bottom and there's no boiling water and there is none here, then you know that that is going to be finished. I'm just going to turn off the heat. Move it with my fork slightly to fluff it. And that rice is ready to go. Remember, don't make rice difficult. It's a very simple thing. Now. 
Let's assemble our beautiful well, dish. We have everything already cooked up. Our rice is ready. Our entree is ready. And the wonderful thing is, is this is a single dish all in one. First thing I want to do is I'm going to put plenty of this sauce, the juice here, right down into this bowl. There we go. Now, take one of my chicken breasts, set it up on top. Isn't that simple? Beautiful. Now, our rice. Let's just get that off the side here. And that's all there is to it. Very simple, elegant, and exceptionally tasty dish. Well, there's just not a lot to this dish. However, the flavors are unbelievable. Oh, I can't wait. I have just been having a fit for this. Oh, chicken, it's hard to cut, but it's just falling apart quite literally. And as you put it down in the juice, the chicken takes on the flavor of that juice. It tastes absolutely wonderful. Chicken poblano. goodness. Mm. This is magical flavor that comes from it. It is indescribable. For one of the easiest meals you'll ever make, you're going to be blown away at how good this tastes. Mm. Chicken poblano. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for watching Texas Cooking today. To my subscribers, thank you. And if you haven't subscribed, please do. You have a good day. Thank you for watching Texas Cooking Today, the show where you can get great recipes and the best techniques are taught. Please subscribe to Texas Cooking Today, where you will always find something hot and ready to eat.